I do want today to talk about church financial statements. And let me give you two reasons that you ought to listen today, because I know you've got a lot on your mind. Some of you are tempted to look at your Hebrew cards, etc. Let me give you two reasons this is important for you. Number one, I can tell you practically speaking that the first thing that John MacArthur does, I mean a lot of you have this picture of John as kind of a Mr. Ivory Tower sitting in his study and never meeting the real world. The first thing he does when he's been gone on a weekend and calls in is ask me how the services went. The second thing he does is ask how the offerings went. This is something that you as a pastor will live with your whole life. Reading and understanding the financial statements of your church because that's part of your responsibility and also because it affects your future in a very real and tangible way. And so it's very important that you understand this. There's a second reason though that I think you ought to listen today and find what we have to talk about important and that is what Christ said. Compelling words. You remember um, Christ was in the middle of a series of parables and he makes this sort of startling comment. He says that the faithfulness with which we administer ungodly mammon, as the King James puts it, determines whether we are entrusted with heavenly riches. If you can't be faithful and wise in money, Christ says, then what makes you think you can be entrusted with true riches? There is a sense in which our stewardship in the financial area is a measure of our character, it's a measure of our capacity, it's a measure of what God will grant us from a spiritual standpoint in terms of, in terms of responsibility and opportunity. So this isn't something to be taken lightly. Now, with that said, Basically what I want to do in the next two weeks is give you an overview of the finances of the church. Today we're going to look at the statements that you will regularly get. The questions you ought to be asking, what you ought to be noticing on those statements, why they make any difference at all. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be looking at budgeting. How to take a look at where you are and as you look at a new year, determine what monies ought to be uh, set aside from revenue to be spent on various aspects of ministry in the church or in your department, depending on which you're doing. So, let's start today with financial statements. First of all, it's important to define a couple of terms. Revenue is obvious. That's your, the income that comes into the church. That is, in most churches, exclusively donations. You pass the plate or you have a bucket in the back. You have some way for people to give and that's your revenue. In a few larger churches, there will be some other kinds of revenue as well. There'll be uh, revenue that comes in from school tuition. If you have a Christian school that's attached to the church, you'll also have revenue from, revenue from sales in your bookstore or your tape center or whatever that might be. But most of the revenue will still be donations. That's the money received. Expense, simply the money that's Expenditure. Now, let me just say that some of what I'm going to be covering today is basic because I can't assume that all of you men know all of these things. I'm also going to go beyond basic in a few cases, so some of you who have a financial background will hopefully be able to better embrace what that looks like in a nonprofit. So hopefully I'll cover everybody before we're done today, okay? But uh, stay with me here. Expenses, actual expenses where cash changes hands, that's part of this, where you, you hire Kinko's to print your church bulletin and you give them money. That's one kind of expenditure. There's another kind, though, that's booked, but there's no change in cash. You don't, you don't give somebody cash. For example, depreciation would be the best example of that. In a financial statement, there's a line called depreciation. It recognizes that the value of some of your assets, like equipment, expensive equipment, are depreciating. That is, they're going down in value. And so there's a line item in the budget for an expense called depreciation. Nobody's giving anybody any money. It simply indicates that you have a true expense in that you have this asset that's losing value and that's an expense to you because you spent money on it 
and it's shrinking in value. So both cash and non-cash items can be expenses. By the way, a change in inventory can be an expense. And I won't go into all the details of that, but those of you who have accounting background, background understand that. Asset. You understand that. That is something of monetary value that the organization possesses. Now, there are two kinds of assets. There are what are called current assets. Current assets are those assets that can be converted to cash within a year. Obviously, cash would be one of those. Another would be maybe if you have, you have a small inventory, a two-month inventory of books in, for your bookstore, that's an asset. It's a current asset because you can sell those in two months and, and have cash. So that's current. If it takes longer than a year to convert that asset, then it's called a long-term asset. But again, an asset is something that the entity possesses. Something that has monetary value that the entity possesses. A liability is an obligation that the organization has financially. An obligation to let money uh, out, to pay someone. For example, let, well first of all let me tell you that again with liabilities there are current and long-term liabilities. A current liability is a liability that is due within one year. That's most of your liabilities. You know, your, your utilities, your, they're due every month. That's a current liability. There are also long-term liabilities. For example, maybe your church has a loan on the building and it has, God forbid, a balloon payment in five years. That's a long-term liability. It's not due within a year, but boy, it's looming out there. And it's a liability because it's money the church owes that has to be expenditured. All right. Now, with that in mind, with those terms basically understood, let's look at the, fi the financial statements that you will see every month. Every month of your life as a pastor, you will see these and have to reckon with them and have to understand them. So I want you to, I want you to grasp them today. First of all, there's a balance sheet. The word balance is the important word. It means the two sides of the equation balance. A balance sheet will always what? Balance. In other words, the line item on the top will always exactly to the penny match the line item on the bottom. Where do those two numbers come from? Well, basically, a balance sheet has your assets on the top, your total assets, both short or, or current and long-term assets, and on the bottom it has how those assets are funded. They're funded either in one of two ways. If you have an asset, just stay with me, you'll understand this. If you have an asset, let's take, uh, to make it simple, let's take your car. That's an asset, a personal asset. That would be in the, the top half. That's your asset. How is that asset funded? You have a value, let's say you have a car that's worth $10,000. You're seminary students, many of you may not have a car that's worth $10,000, but you have a car that's worth $10,000. How is that asset funded? Well, probably you've paid some of it off, and so some of it belongs to you. But there's probably some of it that you still owe on a loan. So what do you have there? You have an asset worth $10,000, then you come down to the bottom of the balance sheet, and you're going to show on your balance sheet how that asset is funded. You're going to have a liability for $5,000 because that's what you still owe on the loan. That's money you owe that you're going to have to pay. And then you're going to list Another line item in a nonprofit statement called fund balance. A fund balance is simply the same thing in a nonprofit as a net profit would be or owner's equity in a business. In other words, it's what you really own. <laughs> what the bank doesn't own, but what you own. Does that make sense? So in my little illustration, if you have $10,000 in asset for your car, 
and you owe five thousand and you paid off five thousand, then you would have liability five thousand on the bottom, and uh, in your fund balance, that is what you own outright, and you don't owe anybody for five thousand, and together your total liabilities and fund balance is 10,000. So it balances that asset at the top. Does that make sense? That's a small snapshot of this balance sheet. It, and by the way, that's what a balance sheet is. It is a snapshot at one point in time of the organizational organization's financial health. As I said, it's a list of your assets and how they are funded, either by liabilities or by fund balances. That's fund. For those of you who can't hear my southern accent, F-U-N-D, fund balance. Your fund balance is the same thing as your net worth or your stockholder's equity in a secular business, for those of you who are familiar with those terms. Fund balance is just the nonprofit description of it. Okay? Now, let me show you a sample. Or, no, I'm sorry. Let me go to the, let me go to the next. Um, combined income statement. This is also called a P&L or a profit and loss statement. It's a video of the period's financial results. The one was a snapshot. The balance sheet is a snapshot. The combined income statement is a video of a period of time, usually a month or a quarter or a year. And it matches your financial effort through a period of time with the actual results. Um, so in other words, on a combined income statement, you would have several columns usually. And I'll, give you, I'll show you a sample in a moment when we talk about what to look for on these things. But essentially, you would have several columns. You would have, probably for the month, you would have two columns. One, actual expenditures for each line item versus budget for those line items. What you had budgeted to spend as of or th through that period of time, let's take the month of February for example. You just got your February financial statements, you got your combined income statement, it would have February actual, February budget, and then there would be two other columns. One would say year to date actual, year to date budget. Most organizations will run on a fiscal year of July 1 to June 30. So year to date would not be calendar year, but fiscal year, wherever you stand in the fiscal year. It allows you, the combined income statement, its primary benefit it is it allows you to compare for any given period of time in the year what you budgeted versus what your actual revenue and expenses were. That's its benefit. And we'll talk about how to use it in a minute. Then you will also get a cash flow statement. A cash flow statement is a video of the period's receipt and expenditure of cash. This gives you what I was telling you about, the total assets equal the total liabilities plus the fund balance. Now, let's look at one. Here is the balance sheet. You can see what I was telling you, and I'll just highlight it with an arrow. Here you have all general funds combined as of February 28. Here are your assets. You see the large word there for assets. Here are your liabilities and fund balance. So there are the two halves, if you would, of the balance sheet that will always balance. If you could see from the back, you would see that as of, this was as of 630 2000 and this is as of 228-2000, actually that should read 630-99, and 228-2000, you can see that the total assets as of February 28th of that year were $16,147,954. Now again, if you could see in the back, you would see that down here at the end of that second section, it's exactly the same amount. The two sides balance because you have assets on one side. On the bottom, you have how they're funded. You can see there, there are two sections down here. You have liabilities. In, in that 
category. Let's go back to assets for a moment because I just want to show you a couple things. In assets, you have cash. That's pretty straightforward. You have accounts receivable. That is monies that you're owed that people have promised to pay. For example, maybe it's uh, school tuition. You sent out a bill. You haven't gotten all the money back from those people who owe school tuition. Inventories is another asset. Our bookstore inventory. Uh, property and equipment, an asset. Prepaid expenses are an asset. And then there are other assets as well. By the way, prepaid expenses would be, for example, um, you've paid a company for a 12-month period to service your air conditioners, and you're only three months into that. That's an asset because it's money you've spent that, that uh, has some material worth, has some monetary value. Then you come down to the liabilities, accounts payable. Accounts payable, of course, would be monies where you, have, you owe someone for work done, and you haven't paid them yet. And you, of course, don't want those to get in arrears. That this, for us, would be a normal month's sort of um, accounts payable, a normal flow of what we owe at any given point in time. None of these would be uh, late. Then you have uh, accrued vacation. That's a liability because people have earned vacation, but they haven't taken it yet. So if they left tomorrow, you'd have to pay them for it. That's monetary value that, that you have to expend. Uh, there's a bank loan uh, for some building, uh, a particular building. And then a deferred lease in the seminary, which is a complicated thing I won't get into. You can ignore that because that means nothing to you and your churches. And then fund balances. There's that word I was talking about. That's what of our assets we own outright. In this case, of the 16 million, 9 million 877,000, we own outright. The rest are liabilities. That is, eventually we're going to have to have an expenditure of cash for them. Does that make sense? All right. Now, the combined income statement, as I was telling you, is a video of financial results. And it matches effort with accomplishment. It compares actual to budget. Here's the, the one I want to show you. This is a revenue and expense statement or a combined income statement here at Grace Church. Again, I... I Scanned these as of February 28, 2001. Uh, it doesn't matter. You don't need to see the numbers. You just need to see the layout, see what it looks like. As I was telling you, it's broken down over here by revenue, expenses, total expenses, and then there's some math done down here at the bottom to kind of figure out the difference between the two. Then you have four columns here across the top. Budget, 2000, 2001, actual 2000, 2001. Now this is for eight months. See at the top it says, for all funds combined for eight months ending February 28th. So from July 1st, in other words, into the fiscal year through February. And you have what we budget, where we budgeted to be in revenue and expenses, where we actually were, and then here are some comparative years. Uh, just so you can, and that's helpful, by the way, if your accountant does that. So you can kind of look back and see what eight months looked like the last couple of years. So you can see if there are any variations. I get another report, as I was describing earlier, that shows the month at a time as well. This is for an entire eight-month period. But you get the idea. All right? And then, as I mentioned, uh, oh, by the way, this would be, before I go on, this would be a detailed department report. You can't see and you don't need to see, but what happens is you get a list in our, in our church, you get a list in your department of all the categories, whether you're over or under, and why. There's a little comment out there that explains, you know, this is over because, this is under because, and it just helps us sort of hold a greater accountability in the issue of the budget. Then the cash flow form I was talking about, a video of a period's receipt and expenditure of cash. The records, or I, sh I should say records, starting cash balance. That is, um, when you, whatever the period you're looking at, it gives you a starting cash balance. This is how much cash you had on hand at the beginning of that period. 
Then it tells you what cash you received in donations or tuition or whatever it is, sales in your bookstore. Then how much cash you spent and how through that period of time. Usually it's a month is what you're looking at here. And then finally it gives you a closing cash balance. How much money you started the month with, how much you took in, how much you spent, and how much money you ended the month with. That's a cash flow statement. Here's what it looks like. This is ours, uh, all funds combined, again for the same period. You have sources of cash. Where did we get our cash? Then you have uses of cash. Then you have at the very bottom, uh, down here, the, the math. Increase or decrease in cash, cash on hand, current cash balance. So it does the math to tell you those things I was showing you just a moment ago on the slide. That's your cash flow. Now, what do you look for? You get these statements and you think, what do these mean to me? Let me tell you the key things on each of these to look for. You don't have to be a business major to understand these. And they're very important to the health of your church. First, let's look at the balance sheet. What are you looking for on the balance sheet? First, you're looking for what's called the current ratio. Remember that word current assets and current liabilities? How are those current assets and liabilities defined? Within what period of time? Within a year. So if you divide your current assets by your current liabilities, you get what's called the current ratio. That number should be at least one after you do the division. Why? What does it tell you if it's less than one? It means you're insolvent. It means you don't have enough current monies to handle your current expenditures that are coming due. So this is a key number you want to come up with. It ought to be closer to two, by the way, just for health, and ours is substantially over that. Uh, it varies. It varies from month to month, depending on a number of factors. But it never should be below one, because if you get below one and you have an audit, the auditors will put in your audit that they have a concern about whether or not you can continue as a viable organization. In other words, they'll put what, what's called the going concern clause in your audit, which means we don't think these boys are going to make it because you, can't, you don't have enough cash. You don't have enough current assets to cover your, obli your current obligations. So that's a very important number as you, as an elder, look at your financials to determine. Another thing you want to do in the balance sheet is compare the balance sheet with the previous month, if you're looking at a month, and also the previous year. What are the differences? And were those differences planned? Again, what it's doing is it's giving you a quick shot of, okay, we've got a significant difference in this line item. Why? Did we plan that? How did that happen? So it gives you that, a comparison of snapshots. It's like looking at a snapshot of yourself five years ago and looking at one today and seeing how your hairlines receded. You know, It's the same thing with the finances. What's happening? Did we plan on that? So in this one, you would, ours isn't broken down by current and current. Many are. Just because ours is so complex, we've tried to simplify it, get it on a single sheet. But in most churches, it'll be broken down, and you can ask your accountant, if not, to break it down by current, li current assets, current liabilities, long-term liabilities, so forth. And you can do the math. You can do the division, take those numbers, and just do the division. If it's greater than one, then you're doing well, and the farther up it is, the healthier the organization is, because that means you've got plenty of cash to deal with, plenty of current assets to deal with your current liabilities. If it gets too high, what does that mean? It means you've got money sitting in the bank that you probably ought to be investing somewhere because you've got a lot more money than you need to cover your current liabilities and it's not, it's not doing its work. It's not invested to make money, probably, if it's that current. 
Oh, yeah, I would say if you have, if you're somewhere between two and I would say four at the outside, uh, that's probably where you ought to be. And again, that varies depending on, uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes, some, some savings and investments strategies for churches. A lot of it will depend on your church and where your elder board is and what they think is safe and so forth. So you can't really dictate that. Yes, sir? Have you taken the current ratio, the ratio with, between the assets and the liability? Because it could also be possible that you're buying a lot of stuff. You have, you have bought computers and uh, maybe cars and a lot of goods that are there which are taken as assets, which is actually a liability indirectly. It's not liquid cash. Well, it depends on how you bought it. If, if you bought it outright, then it'll show up in your fund balance because you own it. If you bought it on loan uh, or some sort of deferred payment, then it'll show up as a liability as well as an asset. Also, it's more complicated. I'm, I'm simplifying it for you. It gets more complicated because different pieces of equipment are classified as assets or not as assets. It depends on the value of the equipment uh, and so forth. So, but, but I would say that if you're, the current ratio is the current ratio, and any financial man looking at your balance sheet would be concerned, regardless of how you spend it, if your current ratio is off. Because in the end, you don't have the money to cover coming and current liabilities. So it, you, will, you want to avoid that, regardless of the situation. Yes, sir? Your current assets don't include your buildings. No, your current assets do not include your buildings most of the time because, again, there's, there's a time that's going to be considered to liquidate that building. And it's not like owning a home. If you have a large piece of property, it's going to take a long time to liquidate it. But it, again, it varies sometimes by region. Uh, but there, there are generally accepted accounting principles in, that, are, that are sort of standardized across the U.S. And so some of these things will be standard everywhere. But there also are a few variations. But no, your buildings would not be considered current assets. Cash, money markets, um, uh, accounts receivable that are expected within a short period of time, those kinds of things would be as, uh, current assets. Yes, sir? In the sense, say they operate on faith, like they have the monthly budget, and they say they need, you know, 10000 to, to operate, but yet the offering and everything came to 8000 It's been like that for four or five months. Okay, yeah, I will comment on that. Um, the question is, what about churches that say, well, we kind of have a budget, but we really operate on faith? What you're really operating on is presumption, because faith is confidence in the revealed Word of God. God has nowhere promised to fund everything you think ought to be done. And so that's not faith. I mean, in the end, call it what you want, but it's not faith. Faith is confidence in the revealed Word of God, and God has not promised to fund our stupidity. So I may think I need to buy this huge new building, even though we have 200 people, because I believe this is going to help us grow. Where in the Bible has God promised to do that? That's not faith. That's failure to plan. It's failure, failure to be a wise steward of the resources God has provided. Yes, sir. How does that work then when, when you are dependent on donations? Because you can't, I mean, that's, you know, the, the donations in the future aren't your asset. That's a, that's a good question. How do you do this when you're dependent on donations? What you will learn, men, as you look at your finances, is that there is a regular flow to donations. You will be able to look at, first of all, you'll be able to look at, say, February over the last five years and know what basically to expect in February in the next year. It's not like it varies that wildly unless you have one donor who's, you know, giving sporadically, one large donor who's giving sporadically. If it's, if most, and that's rare, most of the time you're going to be able to see trends and you're going to see trends on a given month. You're also going to be able to sit down and look at next year and say, okay, let's look at what our revenue, our donations have done over the last five years. Each year, and we'll talk about this when we get to budgeting, each year they've increased by a certain percentage, so therefore it's, it's legitimate to assume that we can at least budget for what we received this year. And we might even go up as, as high as that common percentage each of the previous years. So it is predictable. It's not wildly variable. Now, we'll, that's a good question. We'll deal with that more when we get to budgeting next week. All right, let's keep moving then. The combined income statement, 
What are you looking for? You're looking for a significant variance from the budget, the actual to the budget of any line item. So as you look at your combined income statement, you come down to, you come down to uh, salaries and benefits. And you have a number in your budget, and the number in your actual is grossly different than the number in your, or just significantly different from the number in your budget. You've got to start asking yourself, why? If the income's up, you know, you, you budgeted for a certain amount of income, then you need to ask yourself why. This is where you get into why. Why is that number different than we budgeted? Is it seasonal? Um, is it the result of a strong economy? For example, is December a lot higher than I expected? Well, if the stock market's raging along and doing great, am I seeing some year-end giving from people who had stock dividends and wanted to get a tax deduction? You know, what are the, what's contributing to that? If the expense is up in a given line item, why? If the expense is down, you might say, all right, our expenses are less than we expect. Don't, less than we expected. Don't get too excited. Because you have to be careful with expenses. Because it could be that it looks better than it is because somebody said, we're going to spend that money in February, but they didn't spend it in February. They're waiting instead till May. And so it could be a, a, an expense that simply hasn't been, hasn't been charged yet. Could be a position not filled. You'll see a lot of this in staff. You'll look at your staff line, your st salary and benefits, and say, oh, gee, it's down. It's great. When in reality, it might simply be that you're still trying to hire a couple of people on the church staff and haven't been able to yet, and so that was money that wasn't spent. So it creates an artificial picture. So you're always asking why. Why is that number different than I expect? You look for significant variance from the previous year. You look at the, this month last year. Why are the two so different in the expense of this particular item? Look at a gradual increase in a line item without the uh, corresponding increase in benefit. Why is that number going up when we haven't added any more ministry in that area? And then, of course, you look for a negative bottom line. When you look at this, that number at the bottom of the combined income statement, when you subtract expenses from revenue, that number should be positive. Okay? You don't have to be a financial genius to figure that out. If it's negative, you better start asking why. Did you plan for it to be negative because it's a slow summer month? Or is there another problem? With a church with a small budget, you have to pay close attention to this because it won't take you but a month or two to get in serious financial trouble if you've got a negative bottom, bottom line on your combined income statement. And we've already looked at this, so I won't take any more time with that. Cash flow statement. What do you look for? Well, you want to examine individual line items and see what you spent your money on. You also want to look and see if there's a decrease in cash from the beginning to the end of the month. Does that make sense? You started with $500 of cash, you, you, you got some money in, you spent some money, and you ended the month with $300 in cash. That's not a positive trend. And so you want to keep an eye on that decrease in cash. And again, we've looked at this, so we won't look at it anymore. Now, any questions before we leave, uh, before we leave financial statements? Any questions about any of those? Yes, sir. So it's kind of along this line, um, but can you comment on churches going into debt? I'm getting there in just a minute. Good question about debt. Any other questions about financial statements? Yes, sir. Sure, I understand. Does the accountant run these reports and then hand them like to the elder board? Is that when you look over them? Yeah, good question. How to kind of what's the process? Basically, the accounting department, or if you don't have an accounting department, you will have an accountant. If it's a if it's a person hired part time, if it's a volunteer person who has that kind of business and and has volunteered to help the church, you will have an accountant of some kind, and that accountant will prepare these reports after the month is ended and submit them to you and to the elder board. And if you have an audit committee, uh, which is helpful,
group a couple of pro financial professionals who can kind of help you do some of this as well and look through it and give you input. Uh, they'll, they'll get it as well. And then at the elders meeting here, uh, the, all the elders get it, but before the elders meeting, or on a few occasions at the elders meeting, there's also a select group of elders who really have more responsibility for that than others. There's the treasurer of our board, who's a lay elder, who's responsible for the financial picture. I am very responsible for the financial picture as well, and then ultimately the chairman of the board. And of course, John takes a heavy interest in the financial statements as well. Um, that's a good question and not one I can really answer. The question was, do you have to keep a balance sheet? Is that required by law? I have never been a part of an organization that hasn't had a balance sheet. That's probably the best way for me to answer it. Uh, you'd have to check with an accountant to see for sure if that's absolutely required. But there is benefit to it, even if it's a small church. Frankly, even for an individual, uh, a balance sheet prepared from time to time on Quicken or something can be helpful because it lets you see what are your assets and how are they funded. And, you know, is, uh, is, do I, is my net worth really very small or even negative? Is that right? There you go. Every any any institution registered as a charitable organization has to have a balance sheet. That would be my my suspicion, but your classmates confirmed it. All right. Now let's go on to maintaining financial integrity. I want to suggest a few ways for you to do this. Um, the larger the church gets, the more fastidious you have to be about this. But frankly, you should be even as a small church, simply for your reputation. Because we all know that how those in legitimate ministry, one of the ways they differ significantly from shysters and, and pretenders, false teachers, is how they handle money. And so you ought to take every step you can to stay completely above board in how your church handles its funds. Starting with, you never touch it. John tells the story early in his ministry, and he doesn't tell it uh, as something to be emulated, but he tells the story early in his ministry. They, they had a, some sort of a, of a meeting, and, and there was an offering taken, and, and um, it was a fairly large gathering, and they ended up just giving it to John and his fellow uh, traveler who was with him to take with him and it was like this large bag of garbage bag of cash or something and he's he's shoving it in the trunk and hoping that they don't get mugged you know as people are watching you learn as you go along that you don't want to touch it you want to stay as a pastor completely away from the finances not in terms of monitoring them but away from actually touching the money that's where it starts. But there's also another place you need to remember, and that is donor privacy. I'm curious, how many of you have ever been in churches where the pastor knew what individuals in the church gave, and perhaps even, this is an A and B question, perhaps even uh, sort of subtly or not so subtly hinted that the individual members needed to give more? Anybody? Yeah. That is a serious breach of financial integrity. And let me tell you why. Because if you, if you know as a pastor what people give, then what's going, what are you going to be tempted to do? Two things. Number one, you're going to be tempted to be judgmental toward the various giving habits of the people. And two, you're going to be tempted to show what? Partiality. People expect that their donations will be kept private. No pastor at Grace Church has access, including myself and including John MacArthur, to individual giving records. Our financial department keeps that completely confidential. There are a few occasions when an especially large gift comes in that we want to, that our accounting department notifies John's office just so he can express in a personal note his gratitude for their generosity.
And we struggled about whether to do that, to be honest with you. But that's as much um, involvement as we ever have with any individual donor giving record. We don't know anything about even the other pastors giving records, staffs giving records. That's something some churches do. They monitor their staffs giving records. That's, a, I think, a serious breach of privacy. And frankly, it's a lack of respect for those people. What it says is, I don't trust you to be spiritually minded. I don't trust you to do what's right. And I'm going to follow up to make sure you are. I would also encourage you to consider the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. This is an entity that your church or, or organization can join that has a set of standards to which you agree to abide. Um, and it, it assures people, it's sort of like a good housekeeping seal of approval on Christian organizations. They, they do police this. They do kick people out if they fail to meet the standards. And so there's a sense in which it gives people confidence that this thing isn't being run uh, you know, in a, in a smoke-filled room somewhere. And by the way, this still happens. You guys read in the paper about that situation out in the desert where not only was this pastor of this large church of 6,000 involved in sexual immorality, but as it turns out, he was also, he and a couple of his close buds were the elders, and they were doing whatever they wanted to do financially. Apparently somebody gave a, a Mercedes to the church, intending that it be sold and the donations be given to the church, and he had it shipped off to his vacation home so he and his family could use it. That kind of stuff goes on. Uh, the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability demands that certain things be done to ensure that those kind of shenanigans don't happen in the entities that are connected to it. And so it's just it's something you ought to consider. And this will be in your, your syllabus at the end that you get at the end of the semester. But I would strongly urge you to consider that. Our church is a member. I would also strongly encourage an audit. Whether you join ECFA or not, you need an annual audit. An independent audit firm, um, like um, Ernst & Young, Capen & Krauss is our audit firm. They specialize in nonprofits. They do a number of other churches. It can be helpful because they can, without giving the names of other entities, they can kind of show how your church, both revenue and expenses, compare with others, how various aspects of your ministry, how much, what percentage of your budget you give toward uh, missions compares with the percentage of budget of other churches, et cetera. So it gives you a point of comparison, but still uh, the other entities maintaining privacy. The way it works is the board s bids out and selects, usually with the help of the audit committee, um, an audit firm. They look at factors like uh, cost, and cost is usually related to two things, the size of your entity and the complexity of your financial situation. For a small church, it won't be that much, but some small churches think, oh, we don't need to spend money on an audit. That's not money well spent. In reality, it is money very well spent because it demonstrates a desire on your part and the elder's part to be completely above board financially. You aren't the only ones who look at your finances and know what's going on. There are others, an outside entity is saying, yes, they're doing things the way they ought to be done financially. What happens is they come and do feed, what's called field work, take a couple of weeks, depending on the size of the entity for us, it takes a couple of weeks, and they'll go through all of our financial statements, they'll spot check uh, individual reimbursements, for example, which is an area that can be abused. Uh, they'll do all of those things, and then They'll submit a final report to the board sometime later. Um, very helpful process. You learn some things, too, about how to improve what you do, how to put protections in place. Listen, guys, you have Christians working in your church, but that does not mean those Christians cannot be tempted to sin, including stealing. We had, we've had a number of instances here at Grace Church and out at Grace to You. We had a guy who worked in the bookstore, who was stealing books out of the bookstore and selling them out of his car trunk to seminary students. We had another guy who was cutting rare book pages out of the, out of the books in the, books in the uh, library. 
We had a guy at Grace to You who was writing himself checks. But what an audit firm can do is help you see where those, those spots are, where you're vulnerable, where people can kind of uh, be tempted and help you put checks and balances in place to keep that from happening. Now, briefly, and just briefly, I'm going to just touch on, stay with me for a couple of seconds here, I'm going to touch on a couple of things just real quickly. The issue of debt, and this is going to be very quick. You can look up the references uh, on your own. They'll be in your notes. Uh, this is not a clear-cut biblical issue. It is clear that charging exorbitant rates and loaning money to God's people who are needy, those things are forbidden. There's no question about that. But the issue of, of going in and taking a loan for something is not a clear-cut issue biblically. The loaning of money, expecting a rate of return, is not inherently wrong. And there are a number of verses that I put in your notes that I don't have time today to go through. And you can read more about this issue anyway. My point is, it comes down to this. It becomes a conscience decision for the board. Your board may be utterly convinced that it would be wrong for them to take a loan. Then guess what? Whatever isn't of faith is sin, Paul says. It would be wrong for your board to do that. For other churches, like ours, for example, we don't believe there's anything wrong with debt. We, we try to avoid it. We don't get into any more debt than we have to at any given point in time. We limit our debt, but we, we do not believe it is wrong to use other people's money as long as it is repaid as agreed. Some would even argue that that isn't a technical definition of debt, that if you are repaying on an installment plan, monies, that that is, doesn't qualify as debt. The debt really becomes more when you have reached a point that you can no longer faithfully fulfill your responsibilities to repay. But regardless, what it comes down to is you will see people argue both sides of this from Scripture. It ultimately becomes a conscience issue for your elder board and your church to decide whether you're going to go into debt. I would say this, I would limit your debt because of the donation issue, because it does ebb and flow with the economy. We'd like to think that people are just so spiritual that they ignore the economy. Doesn't happen. And so, for practical reasons, it's wise to limit your debt, both personally and corporately. One last thing, and I'll let you go. Savings. Scripture makes it clear that wise stewardship means seeking a reasonable return on whatever monies you have. If your church has funds, let's say you're saving for a building program, let's just say that you operate at a, at a plus, which some churches do. I just spoke to a church this last week who has both a surplus in their building fund and they also have a general cash surplus. Very important that you not just let that sit, making no return on it. You got the parable of the talents, which at the very least, while it's teaching something else, it underscores the principle that wise financial stewardship seeks a reasonable return on its money. I would encourage you to do this both as a church and individually as a discipline each month. Force yourself, even in seminary, to save money. Even if it's five bucks a month, do it for the discipline. And the same thing is true with the church. Why? What are you building toward? You're trying to reach an emergency fund. Listen, let's, let's take, uh, in Southern California, we have earthquakes. We cannot get earthquake insurance adequate to cover our facilities. Nonprofits often can't. Certainly, certain kinds of buildings, like tilt-up buildings. Wherever you go, there are going to be issues like that. Floods, tornadoes, etc. You ought to not presume on the Lord and you ought to have a rainy day fund, an emergency fund that you can call on. Perhaps the economy goes in the tank because a major industry moves out of town. You need to help people. Whatever. You need an emergency fund. Both personally and as the church. By the way guys, I would encourage you to shoot personally toward at least three months income in the bank. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult during seminary, but at least discipline yourself now to start setting aside something every month. And then when you're out, you can, you can do more. Produce an, an investment policy. We have one. You don't want it, so I'm not going to give it to you now. But basically, it says what we will and won't do. It helps you avoid schemes, like pyramid schemes, like New Era. You ever heard of New Era? 
It was a, a deal that churches by the hundreds bought into a few years ago, and it went belly up. It was a pyramid scheme. And if churches had had an investment policy that was reasonable, that protected them, their pastors wouldn't have gone and put all their church's excess money in this deal and seen it go down, go down the tubes. And one little caution, make sure you watch FDIC limits. The church very easily can have more than $100,000 in cash. Remember that it's only insured in any given financial institution up to $100,000. So you want to spread it around. All right. Well, that's it for today. We will see you next week. But I hope you'll pay careful attention to, the, to understanding the church's finances and being a wise steward of them. Well, as I said, this afternoon I want us to briefly go through the issue of preparing and policing a budget. This is something that, first of all, you should be doing in your personal life. I hope your family has a budget, uh, or if you're unmarried, I hope you have some kind of budget. You aren't just sort of uh, looking with surprise every time you get that bank statement with what you've spent and what you've taken in. And you certainly need one for any organization that you're going to be leading, that you're going to be a part of, or if you're going to be a departmental pastor, that is a youth pastor or a family ministries pastor or whatever, you're going to need to do the same thing that we're talking about today in that capacity. So I trust that I'm going to approach it in a way that it will be helpful for you regardless of which of those situations you find yourself in at any point in time. All right, let's start first of all with preparing a budget. Why exactly do you need one? What are the benefits that a budget brings? Well, first of all, it allows you to plan. It allows you to look at the coming year and to say, this is what we expect to bring in in revenue, and these are the expenses that we expect to have in that given year. So it allows you to lay out, like Christ said, you know, the man who's going to build a tower, he has to sit down and, and he, again, used in the example of discipleship, but he's, he's stressing the point that that's just wisdom. You need to plan of whether you're going to have sufficient financial resources to complete whatever you're planning, whether it's building a tower or whether it's ministry in a church. And so a budget allows you to do that, to sort of lay out a plan for the year and say, here's what we expect to take in, here's what we expect to spend, and that makes sense together. It also allows you to control. A budget is a great tool to control spending in the church. If you're a senior pastor of a church that has several on the pastoral staff, you will really appreciate this aspect of a budget. Because you're going to hire guys like yourself who have a certain degree of entrepreneurial spirit, who want to uh, sort of make their ministries happen, and, and money's no object. We've got to reach these people. And uh, so you will be happy that there's some tool in place not only to plan for the coming year, but also to control expenditures as ideas come up and as expenditures are made. Those are the two per primary purposes of a budget, and both of them are crucial. And so you cannot, let me put it this way, you cannot and you will not it serve in a church that doesn't have a budgeting process. It doesn't happen. And if it does, then you have to become the driving force to make sure it does happen. What are the common approaches to budgeting? When you think about uh, this whole process, how do people approach it? Well, first of all, let me talk briefly about historical versus zero-based budgeting. These, this is two different approaches. These are two different approaches to how you begin one, the historical approach says, let's look at previous year's history. That's the historical approach, of course. Let's look at what we spent last year, what revenue we brought in last year. In fact, let's look at several years and see if there are trends in some of the categories, both in revenue and expenses. This is how most churches 
will budget. When you get into a situation, some of you already are in there, if you are involved in budgeting, this is how it's usually done. You have a budget that you inherited, somebody else put together, and you'll come in some point in the year and you'll sort of police that through the rest of the year and then you'll sort of start with what the other guy had and either add to or subtract. <laughs> Usually it's not subtracting, in my experience. Um, you'll, you will somehow vary what's been given you, the history that's been given you. The other approach is zero-based budgeting. This approach means that every department begins with zero dollars. And whatever they put in their budget, they have to defend or justify as crucial to their department. You have to, you have to start, in some cases, by taking this approach. If you go into a situation where the church is 150 years old and nobody has ever come in and looked at what expenditures are made, you may want to encourage a zero-based budget for one year. That's not really effective to do it every year because then it takes so much additional time. But occasionally, there might be some good reason to do a zero-based budget so that you see what fat has been added in various departments because that's how it happens. It's just like it happens in the government. Well, we can't ask for less money this year than we asked for last year or it'll look like we're not doing our job or something. And so we've got to either have the same amount as last year or better yet, we've got to add to last year. And sometimes that money isn't needed. So a zero-based budget can sort of help you discern what really is the fat and, and you can sort of trim. This also, the zero-based budget works very effectively if you're in financial trouble. If the church really has a difficult financial hurdle in front of it, then you can do zero-based budgeting and, and help uh, cut all those extras out and just come back to the essentials. But most of the time you'll be doing historical based budgeting. There's another category of approaches and that is activity versus departmental budgeting. And I just mentioned this, most of the time the budgeting you're going to see is departmental. That is, you get the youth ministry budget or you get the family ministry budget and you've got to work on that. There is occasion for using what's called an activity based budget. And again, I wouldn't do this every year, but it is very telling. For example, if you combined all of the expenses relating to, let's say, your youth camp. Let's just take youth camp for a moment as an illustration. I'm picking on youth ministry, so we'll just continue to sort of drive the, drive the nail in here. You have, you have youth ministries, and somewhere on the youth ministries budget, there's a line called youth camps and there's a number. But is that all the cost connected to youth camps? No. Why? First of all, you've got man hours. Those man hours aren't in that number. How many hours did it take the staff to prepare for youth camp, to be paid during youth camp, and to debrief after youth camp? What about printing, brochures, materials? That isn't in that line item either, perhaps. Maybe that's in another line item in your communications department if you have a larger church, or if you have a smaller church, it's just kind of a miscellaneous business expense somewhere. But that's part of the cost of running a camp. And if you don't know what it really costs you, then you may actually be spending a lot of money on some ministry that you don't know you're spending. So there is occasion, there are proper occasions to step back and ask your accountant to say, let's look at what it costs to do this activity. Forget the departments for a minute. What about this activity or this kind of ministry? What are we spending in, in every regard? But again, most of the time as you look at these two, you're going to be doing historical and departmental. That's where you'll be most of the time. Now, what about the process of budgeting? It begins very simply with deciding on a revenue projection. The elders determine what the revenue, you're basically saying, okay, let's say you have a fiscal, a fiscal year of July 1 to June 30. Sometime about now in the, in the calendar year, in early April, you're going to sit down with some elders or, or with all of your elders or with someone the elders have designated to say, let's determine 
what our revenue projection is for next year. What do we expect the giving and or sales and or school tuition, et cetera, to be? Now, the wrong approach is what I would call faith budgeting. We talked about this a little bit last week. Well, you know, we just believe God has called us to do this, and so we're going to just depend on God, and we're going to inflate our revenue by 10% for next year, even though we've never seen an increase in any year of more than 1% over the previous year. We're just going to trust God. That's not trusting God. God hasn't promised, as we talked about last week, God hasn't promised to do that. And that's not even faith budgeting. I should have it in quotations here because it's not really faith. By the way, this is not uncommon. I had, a, I had a meeting when I was at Grace to You. I had a meeting with another, with the head of another large, very large media ministry. You would recognize the name of the ministry. You would recognize the speaker on that ministry. You would recognize the, person, the, the name of the person I was speaking to if I told you. And we were talking about issues and struggles and kind of comparing notes on what we were dealing with in the two organizations. And I asked him, so, you know, what are you, what are you dealing with right now? And he said, well, we really need some, a new uh, computer system, ministry-wide. And we've, we've done some research on it, and it's very expensive. It's going to cost us $300,000 to do this. And I said, wow, you know, that's a, that's a pretty hefty expenditure. What are you going to do about that? He said, well, you know, we've just been praying about it. And he just, unfortunately, he had just read Henry Blackaby's book, Experiencing God. And, and so he had become convinced that this is what God was doing and he needed to get on board with it. And so they decided to inflate their budget by 200000 beyond their other projections, just believing this is what God wanted them to do. Well, I don't have to tell you what happened during that fiscal year. They started sending out desperate appeal letters at the, toward the end of the fiscal year because they weren't meeting their revenue projections. Why? Because they'd based their revenue projections on blue sky. There was nothing substantive on which it was based. Now, what are some solid bases on which to set revenue projections? Two reasonable, reasonable approaches to take as you determine the revenue of the organization. First of all, based on the current year actual. For example, right now, we, are in, we, are, we have completed at Grace Church, completed the books on, or almost completed the books, on March. So if we sit down to project revenue, we could say, all right, we've completed nine months of this fiscal year. Now let's take nine months revenue, divide it by 9, and multiply it times 12. That is a reasonable expectation for what our actual revenue will be this year. So let's project that as our actual revenue next year. Does that make sense? I mean, that's reasonable. It's even reasonable to take a step beyond that and to say, let's look at the last five years. Over the last five years, our revenue has grown each year by an average of 5%. Well, if you want to be a little more aggressive, you could say it's reasonable. It's certainly not foolish to say that barring any major catastrophe in the economy, we could expect a 5% growth over our revenue for this year. And so you make that your revenue projection for next year. You see what I'm saying? A multi-year. You don't want to do it on a single year because that could be an anomaly. You know, one person may have given a large gift that sort of boosted your revenue, or uh, maybe it was a, an especially good year in the stock market and people gave a lot toward year end. So you can't do it on one year, but if you look at a multi-year pattern and you take the, the average or the smallest percentage of growth for that five-year period, let's say, and you project that for your growth for, from this year to next year. Does that make sense? That's reasonable. You might even say, you know, we want to bump it a percent or two if you want to really get aggressive because we, we think we're, we're poised on the area of growth or whatever. That's real aggressive. But if you start saying, I'm just going to forget history 
and we're just going to kind of say, this is what we want to spend, and so we're going to set our revenue based on our expenses, then you've taken the wholly wrong approach. Start by looking at revenue and projecting it. Then once you've done that, you distribute the departmental budgets. The accounting office or your accountant, if you only have, if it's a smaller church, there will be a person, as I said before, who is doing the accounting. It has to happen. Your accountant or your accounting department will distribute budget worksheets to each of the departments. They'll say, all right, here you go, youth, youth pastor, here's your budget. Now, what are they going to give you? First of all, they should give you something that reflects some history, a year or two, so you have something to compare against. What were your budgets for a couple of years, and what were your actuals for a couple of years, just so you have something to compare against as you look at it. It should also be accompanied by general ledger details. In other words, all the detail expenses for that year. $500 to Kinko's for printing the, the camp brochures in the month of March. So that as you plan your budget, you remember, oh yeah, our camp's in June and we need to print those brochures in March and so that expense, guess what, it's going to be there again next year. So that's how those detailed things help you, help you plan toward what your, where your specific expenditures are going to be. By the way, I would encourage you to have your, your accountant email you the documents in Excel format or some format like that. It just saves a lot of time. That's what we do. Uh, in fact, I just got them this week for this year, my, my, my department budgets. I have three departments that I fill out, and then each of the pastors have uh, one that they fill out as well. I ask, and this may vary based on the size of your church, but just as a point of illustration, here at Grace Church, I ask the pastors as they prepare their budgets to give me an explanation of any line item that increases by more than $500. If it's less than that, I really, in the scope of our budget, I don't really want to see it. But if it's more than $500, then I want to know why did you increase that line item by that, by that amount? What's, what are we adding? What new ministry are we doing? Now, there's a reason for that. Because in, a, in the next step or two, I'm going to compare the expense numbers we got from all the departments with that revenue projection. What happens if we're in the red? I've got to go back and find some ways to trim the expenses so they, they match. And if I have this report of these... These, these additions to the budget, then that makes life a lot easier for them and for me. And of course, as I mentioned, the lay elders serving in that department should be involved in this process of preparing, of preparing the departmental reports. And then expense projections are prepared. The controller, your accountant, We'll take those departmental budgets and put them all together into a single unified document that gives you some idea of what your total projected expenses for the coming year are. Then what he'll do is meet, typically our controller will meet with me when he gets to that stage. We've already set the, the, um, expen the revenue projections. And by the way, I should tell you at Grace Church, the elders have designated me, the controller, and the, the treasurer of the board, who's usually a lay elder, as the ones who get together to set the revenue projection. They will eventually approve it, but we're the ones who initially set it, sort of set a target to shoot for. So then when we get the departmental reports, the controller does, he puts all that together. He has one document that has all the projected expenses for the coming year. We compare that with our projected revenue number. Then what happens? Well, if it doesn't fit, in other words, if it's in the red, if our projected revenue is less than our projected expenses, obviously we don't want to start the year that way. We don't want to plan a year where we're spending more than we're taking in. And so then I will usually meet with each department and go through their additions. Here's what you added. Now, I do that 
differently than some churches do. And let me explain why. Some churches will simply say to the departments, look guys, we're over by, uh, we're over budget, or uh, we're over projections by $70,000. In other words, you guys have planned to spend $70,000 more than we've planned to take in. So, there are eight departments here, so we're just going to divide that by eight, and each of you cut that out of your budgets. Now, what's the problem with that? You think of a problem? Those departments are different in size. Some of them may have very large budgets, and others of them may have very small budgets. Also, one of them, their ministry might be more foundational and crucial to the church than this ministry you added over here. And so you just can't, I don't think, wisely make sort of a sweeping across the board. Each of you cut 10% from your budget. Or each of you cut, you know, this X, X number of dollars from your budget. What I do and prefer to do and would encourage you to consider is going, taking that list of additions. Now you've got that list in front of you the accountant has put together of those additional expenditures that have been put into this budget. That's where your problem lies, right? Unless your revenue, you projected less revenue for the coming year. Um, your problem lies in your expenses. And so I go then and meet with each department head and say, all right, let's talk about how to resolve the problem we have here. And work through each item and we end up cutting until the revenue and the expenses are at least even. And preferably, we're actually to the positive. We're, we're going to leave a cash balance at the end of the year. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. You said not to cut each department the same amount, but if you did it on a percentage, because then if one department has a million dollar budget and another has a hundred thousand, if you do it on a five percent, then they only use that. That would be fair. The question is, well, if you're not going to tell them to cut a certain dollar amount out of each department, what about cutting a percentage out of each department? On the surface, that appears fair, and it's more. It's definitely more uh, fair and more equitable than giving them a dollar amount. But again. I don't want to be forced into that situation because the truth is there may be, as there is at Grace Church, there may be one department that by comparison budget-wise is huge compared to the other departments. It's going to be a lot easier, there's going to be a lot less bloodshed, if you would, to cut that money out of that size budget than it's going to be to cut it out of this guy over here who's got a thimble full. So personally, I still don't like the percentage basis. I still like to take a look at the, the overall and say where is where are the, the best ways to cut that amount of money? What are the projects, what are the, the expenses that will be the easiest to trim without creating problems either among the staff or the membership? Now, of course, if it's in the black, if when you get the budget, it works, the, the revenue exceeds expenses, then it then goes to the pastoral staff for a tentative approval. Once the pastoral staff approves it, then it goes to the full elder board for approval. The controller will take it to the audit committee and he'll take it to the full board. And then the board will review it, will have any discussion about the specific uh, items that are there. Although, again, the larger the church and the more uh, complex the numbers, the bigger picture the board's going to want to deal with. When the board looks at our, when the Grace Church Elder Board looks at our budget, they don't look at all the little ticky tack details in everybody's budget. That's the controller's job, and if he flags it in my attention, my job, the elder board wants to see the big picture. Are we in the black? How does it compare with last year? Etc. And then they will approve it. Now here's a sample timeline just to give you an idea, and this will be in your notes in your syllabus at the end of the semester, but just to give you a little idea. This was uh, the year I put this, this presentation together, this was the timeline. The budget worksheets were distributed March 20, um, and then we were supposed to have them completed by April 9, the individual departments. And then they were compiled and brought back to the senior staff on April 23rd. The, compiled, of course, by the controller, by the accounting department. And then if there were any budget issues, we left a, a time window there to resolve 
those problems if in fact we were in the red and we needed to trim some of our projected expenses to make the budget balance. And then finally we presented the budget to the elder board at the May 17th meeting approving the budget for the fiscal year that would begin July 1. So that kind of gives you, our preference is to approve the budget in May. That gives the accounting staff time to get it sort of on computer and ready to roll for July 1. We have, in fact, last year, I think, we went, because of a, a meeting problem, we went into June, but that's not normal. This year, we're, we're shooting again for May to get it to the elders for approval. Yes, sir? No, the controller is a staff member of Grace Church, but he takes the budget where the, where the checks and balances come twofold, threefold really. One with me, secondly with the audit committee, which are not staff members, but have volunteered to, to help us on the financial side and to, to hold accountability, and then the elder board. So those would be the groups that have to sign off on the big picture, the controller, me, the pastoral staff, I should add, the audit committee, and then eventually the elder board. So all those groups really sign off on the budget before it's approved. Yes, sir? When, uh, let's say, the outreach person submits his, his uh, worksheet, the senior staff looks at it and decides, you know, he really wants the money for this, but we can't give that to him. How do you, uh, at what point do you communicate that to him? Does he find out when the budget comes out? Do you talk to him about it before you decide to cut yeah. it? How do you deal yeah, good question. What if you need to cut some from the expense side of the budget and, and you need to do that, do you inform, when do you inform the guy who's put that in his budget? Does that happen when he sees the budget or, or so forth? Um, preferably and usually you should be talking with him before you cut it. I try to do that so that we're not trimming something from a guy's budget he's put in unless he's agreeing with me that that's the right thing to do. Now, I'll try to do as best sales job I can to convince him of that, but, uh, and usually that's true. Usually, you know, we're trying to think of the big picture, and, and I'm not going to ask him to cut something that doesn't make sense for him to cut because we're all about ministry. So usually that's not a big issue, but no, I want them to buy into that or at least agree, even if they're not real thrilled with it, before we move ahead. There might be a, an occasion here or there where that happens, but uh, it's not on purpose, and it's not... Um, malicious in any way. Yes, sir? I just wonder if the opposite's ever happened where you're too much in the black and you have to go to the departments and say, you guys need to spend some more money. Have, have we ever ended up with this projected budget being too much in the black and we have to go back to the departments and say, you need to spend more money? Never. And that will never happen to you either because uh, you're going to have guys who are eager to do their ministry and they, they have all these ideas and they, you know, we can add this guy and we can add this ministry and no, they're always pushing the envelope for more money because, and the benefit, the, the purpose is good, the reason is good, it's to expand their ministry. But that's going to be what you have to fight. When the budget is presented at the board, are there assurances that it will be approved at that one day? When the budget is presented at the elder board, is, are there fairly, are there assurances it will be approved in one day? No. And that's why we prefer for it to come in May so that if there are issues, then we have a month before the June meeting to finalize it and then really approve it in June and start it July 1. But realistically and usually it does pass and the reason is if the pastoral staff elders have been involved in preparing their budgets and their lay elder partners have been pre involved in preparing their budgets with them then there are no surprises. By the time it gets to the elder meeting everybody knows what's in their budget and has agreed to have what's there there or to cut whatever we've cut and so it's usually not an issue. And that's, by the way, the best way to do it. The best way to, to build a budget is to build it with a consensus of your elders in, in the departments so that you're not having this knockdown drag out where you're sort of surprising people with the money they're getting or not getting. Say, for example, take up a department, say, like children's ministry, and they want to put forward, it's time for budget. And they have, they have a budget. And uh, how do they go about it? Whom do they report to? And uh, that person reports to whom? And finally, when does it come to the controller? OK. You know, the question is sort of, sort of what's, a, what's a flow of how a budget works? I'll give you, let's take, since you mentioned children's ministry, let's take that as an example. 
Basically, once the controller has pulled the data together on the previous year's actual for children's ministry and the previous year's budget and the history that he wants them to have, the detail ledger to whatever extent they've requested it, they get all of that in the children's ministry um, division head gets that budget. Now, he may distribute portions of it to the various guys who work with him who oversee different categories, or he may do it himself, and I'm, I'm saying that because it varies by department. Different departments handle it different ways. But he may either do it himself as the division head, working with his guys, bringing them in, meeting with them, sort of talking through individual line items and issues, or he may delegate that entire section uh, that, let's say, for Sunday morning ministry. He may say, here, or nursery, here, you take this, you work on it, and then when you've got it complete, let's get back together and talk about it and see where there are variations and so forth. Ultimately, the division leader is responsible for it, but he may delegate portions of it down the line. Then it comes back, eventually he will, he will be satisfied that it's in the form it ought to be in. And from there, it goes to, and of course his lay elders have been involved in that. His lay elders have been involved in that process and have signed off on it, have said, yeah, we, we agree with that, we disagree with that, and they've worked all that out. Then when they've got it done in their department, it goes to the controller. He puts it all together as a package, and it comes to the pastoral staff, and children's ministry is one category in the budget we see, and, um, and so forth. And then it goes through that cycle I've described to you. Does that make sense? How do you, if you approach a zero-dollar kind of budget to see maybe you want to know what kind of departments get a certain amount of money, or even if you don't have a zero-dollar budget, but you just want to, I mean, there's certain churches that, I mean, this church has, like, the Shepherd's Conference and other things that most churches wouldn't have, but there are certain elements, like the children's ministry or, or um, outreach or certain things. How do you delegate what percentage of a budget they would get? Because there's certain things that are more essential to a church, and they need, you know, a larger right. budget. Right. If you do it, the question is, if you do a zero-based budget, how do you go about determining what percentage of revenue individual departments get? A zero-based a zero budget, you don't really do it that way. Instead, you say to them, look, you have a ministry you need to do. You, you show me line by line how you're going to spend, how you need to spend money on your ministry this year and to what amount. And so they go by line, line by line and say, this is what I have to spend. We have this missionary in, in uh, you know, Zimbabwe. We have this missionary in, in, New, in uh, England. Sorry, in New England. That's probably needed to. Um, but in England, and, and, and then we have these administrative costs that we have to have, these are hard costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and they're basically building a case for why they need a certain amount of money. And that's, that's a zero-based budget. It's not so much assigning percentages as it is with each department saying, okay, let's start at the bottom line. You have no money, but you do have ministry. Tell me now what money you have to have to do your ministry this year, line by line. Make sense? All right, let's keep moving. Now, what about actually preparing a budget? Let me walk you through this briefly, because here's what's going to happen. Your first few months, or at least your first year as a pastor, you're probably going to be sitting at your desk, and the accounting guy is going to come in, and he's going to throw some paper on your desk and it's going to be your budget. What do you do? How do you start working on it? First of all, before that time happens, there's some things you can do to make it simpler once it does happen. Prior to preparing your budget, first of all, create a folder for next year's budget. Immediately go ahead and when you, when you, the day you start, create a folder called budget and whatever the next year is and begin as you think about things that you need to do, expenses you need to have for the next year, make a little handwritten note and drop it in the folder. You don't have to think about it again until it's time to prepare your budget. But you'll have them all there to, to pique your memory about, oh yeah, I wanted to build in money to do this project or whatever. Secondly, keep notes about new items to include or changes to existing items. That's what I was just commenting on. And then Carefully track your monthly expenses in the current fiscal year. In other words, look at the financial report carefully. You've got a line item that says hosting, and it's got you know, uh, 
hosting and receptions, maybe a category, let's say, and it's got a, a $1,200 in the month of March, well, you need to find out what was that? Where did that come from? And how did we spend that? And as you learn those, those issues, you begin then to know what needs to be planned for the next year, whether that needs to be included in next year's budget or whether it doesn't, if it was a one-time deal. And then make sure you know what is charged, as I mentioned, to each line item. When you look at a line item on your budget, in other words, you get a department budget, it'll have, um, it'll have something about payroll. You ought to know what's in that payroll number. Who is that? And how much are they being paid? And then there'll be a line item for something like uh, printed materials. You ought to know what printed materials are being charged to your budget over the process of a year, et cetera. So you need to inform yourself before it's budget time of what goes into that line, what, what's charged to that line in my budget. Then during the process, there are several things you can do. First of all, you get your budget worksheet. First thing is keep careful notes of what's in each line item and each month's exact expenses. In other words, as you prepare your budget, think about the next year. Be thinking, I don't want to have to rediscover what I put in this number next year. Excel, if you use it, how many of you just out of curiosity have used some of Excel at some point? Excel is a very helpful tool in this way because you can put a number in a line item and then you can put a footnote on it, a little Excel note that says this is this $1,200, $700 of it is for camp expenses and the balance of it is for X expenses. That way, next year, when you look at that number, you're not stuck asking yourself, I wonder what in the world that was. That's a waste of your time. So make sure as you go through this, you're always thinking of how to save time for the next year. Review the budget for the current and the previous two years on each line item. In other words, see what, take your line item camps, for example, you're a youth minister, and look at what your budget and actuals were for a couple of years and what they are this year before you do your budget for next year and see if you see growth there, what's happening, why is that number growing, why is it shrinking, is there an anomaly or do I need to account for that in my budgeting for this coming fiscal year? Compare the current year's actual to budget. Don't just look at your budget number for this year and sort of rewrite that in the budget number for next year. Because if you've actually spent a lot more and you're going to spend that same amount next year, then your budget needs to reflect that. A budget's only helpful if it's accurate. Determine whatever reasons there are for variance in those numbers and determine if that's temporary or it's going to be true next year too. So I better change my budget. Make sure then that you assign one-time expenses to line items and specific months. For example, I've, I've used youth ministry, so take camp. When are you, if, you have a, if you have a July youth camp, when are you going to see your expenses for that youth camp, the bulk of them? July or August, when your bill post date from all the, all the places that you use to help make that camp likely. You're also going to have some in June because you, you're building up to it. So you can look at previous years and get a pretty good idea of when those camp expenses fall and go ahead and assign those in your budget to specific months. You know in June you're going to need X number of dollars for camp, in July you're going to need X number of dollars for camp, and in August you're going to need X dollars for camp because it's through that, that's how it always works. Go ahead and assign those. And then budget on a history of monthly patterns. What I mean here is, take for example, electricity. If you live in Southern California, you know that the hot months of the year are July through October. So you know that with air conditioning, your expenses are, for electricity are going to be a lot higher during those months. Let your budget reflect that. 
And that's an example you may not have to budget, but I'm just showing you how to let your budget reflect those patterns that you see over the years you look at. Print brochures, for example, here. You know those visitor's brochures we hand out on Sundays? Those are fairly expensive. We've done that on purpose because we want our, to put our best foot forward with our guests. When do we give out the bulk of our visitor brochures? Christmas concerts. When we have all these extra visitors come in for those. So we know coming up to the, the Christmas concert, we're going to have our heaviest hit financially on printing of visitor's brochures. So that ought to be budgeted in that time period. So just think in terms of where those expenses fall. Make sure in your budgeting that you avoid surprises. Don't include any new major items that haven't already been discussed and approved with, with the staff, with your elders. You know, don't say, um, I'm just going to see if I can sneak this through, you know, and sort of slip it under the accountant's nose. That'll never work out well, trust me. All right, quickly, policing the budget. You've prepared it, it's in place, you've done everything you can do. Now, what do you do during the year itself? First of all, let's look at the entire budget. What are some things you ought to be aware of as you, if you're the, if you're the senior pastor and you're responsible for the whole deal? What do you ought to be looking for? What ought you to be looking for? First of all, make sure that all large expense items are included in the budget. Before the budget is approved, it's your job to make sure that you have helped everybody think through all the large expense items for that year. Do you need a new roof in the coming year? Did you patch it the last time you could patch it this past year? You need a new air conditioning system. Does the building, the worship center need to be repainted? Do you need a new phone system? All of those things that are big dollar items, it's your job to make sure that those get included in the budget because if they don't, it submarines the whole budget the next year. If it comes up and you've got to do it, then something's got to happen. If your revenue hasn't grown exponentially, you've got to cut some other ministry that you planned on doing to make room for that expenditure. So make sure that you do that. Secondly, make sure that you budget revenue on a seasonal basis versus straight lining it. In other words, don't take your revenue projection. Our church is going to bring in 1.2 million this next year. That's our revenue projection. And we're just going to divide that by 12 and say for each month we're going to bring in $100,000. Why isn't that helpful? Because that isn't how it's going to come in. And if you look at the budget history, you'll see that. For most churches, the bulk of your giving I think it's, uh, I want to say, it's between 20 and 30 percent of your donations will come in the months of December and January. So guess what? That's where 20 to 30 percent of your revenue ought to be budgeted. Same thing with, uh, if you look at February. February is typically the lowest month. It's not a summer month, typically. It varies by church. But for our church, it's not February. I mean, it's not the summer, it's February. Why? Because, first of all, February has fewer days. Secondly, people are paying off their Christmas credit card debt, unfortunately, and others are planning toward tax day. So for whatever reason, February tends to be the greatest hit. So budget on that basis. That way you get an accurate picture because if you straight line it, if you just divide it by 12, you look at the budget in August and everybody's been away on vacation and the giving, it looks awful. It looks like we're going in the tank. And then you get to December, and it's off the charts. Wow, we're doing wonderful. But that's not an accurate picture if you compare it to the previous years, the percentage of giving that came in those months. So make sure you have your accountant do that. If you don't remember anything else I said today, that will save you a lot of grief. Watch the actual revenue versus the budget. As the senior pastor, the guy at the top looking over the whole deal, and frankly, even as an elder, even if you're over a department, you ought to be taking this responsibility seriously. What's happening? Are we actually meeting our budget or are we exceeding it? And if we're exceeding it, then we need to make some steps. Don't panic over a single month. You know, don't look at a single month and go, oh my goodness, we spent more than we planned and we took in less than we planned. You know, look for trends. 
But once there's a trend, before you go in the, in the tank financially, you need to take steps to arrest that problem, which usually means letting the people know you have a problem and cutting expenses. In the end, if I can make a big comment about budgeting, we believe philosophically that the Lord pays for what he orders. And if he isn't paying for it, that must have meant we misunderstood that he ordered it. Watch each department's variance from budget. If a department's sort of wildly varying from the numbers they gave you, then go find out, find out why, or send your accountant to go find out why. That's being a good steward of the Lord's resources. Schedule new expenses or new staff positions after year in giving. Let me tell you what often happens for guys who don't have a financial mind. They say, all right, fiscal year begins July 1. I've got four new things I want to add, so I'm going to add them all in July so I can get this puppy rolling. Well, what's, what's wrong with that? If everyone puts all their new expenses in July when the church's giving is lower than it will be at year end, you've created a cash flow problem. Yes, budget-wise it may look fine, but you don't have the cash to do it until you get later in the year. Does that make sense? So budget those things after you're in giving, those new things, so you don't take the hit. That also gives you a chance to correct your course. Let's say you, you, uh, you've budgeted to get a new phone system for the church. That's going to cost you thirty, forty thousand, depending on the size of the church. Here it's a lot more than that. You get to January and you realize there's been another 9-11 incident and the tank has, has uh, the, the economy's gone in the tank and people aren't giving, well, guess what? Then you can pull off that and say, you know, we need to wait to next year on that phone system. Let's put a little more bailing wire and tape on it, and we'll make it to next year. But if you've spent it in July, then you, there's no going back. So there's a lot of wisdom, frankly, in this one. And then insist that new ministries, projects, staff be budgeted for the next fiscal year. Let me tell you what will always happen. Every year, you will have guys coming to you whining about, We've got to have a new guy. My first response is, great, let's talk about it when we look for the next fiscal year. Let's see if it makes sense then. Usually the emergency isn't really an emergency. Occasionally it is, and occasionally you need to, to make a variance and say, all right, we're just going to add, add this guy. But usually it's just exuberance that needs to be directed toward the next fiscal year. One last slide, and I'll let you go. Into the fiscal year as a department, make sure that you examine your monthly reports. It, by the way, somebody asked me last week, do I really need to spend all this time going through all this financial stuff? Reviewing the monthly, the monthly reports I talked about last week, I'm not talking about days. I'm talking about 15, 20 minutes of your month. It won't take you that long to do what I was sharing with you, but it's crucial that you do it. Examine your monthly reports for incorrect numbers. Sometimes, if you have a larger church, even if you have a smaller church, numbers can get punched in incorrectly. Somebody else's expense got in your budget, was charged to your budget, or an incorrect line item. Also, look at it for actual to, to um, budget. And then as you go through the year, create a list in your calendar of each month's unusual budget expenditures. For example, you planned, you, as you sat down to your budget, you said, you know what, my secretary desperately needs a new desk and chair. This is 1970s vintage, and for her sake, for the church's sake, we've got to replace that. You had the best of intentions. You put it in the budget. But if you're not aware and reminded that you in were intending to do that, you reach the end of the year and you haven't done that. So what I do is for unusual expenditures like that, is I'll write them in my calendar at the beginning of a month the month I budgeted them, to say, I intended this month to get such and such, to order such and such. That way, it's there, and I know, it's, I know about it, and I don't have to look back at my budget all the time to decipher that. 